Okay, we are back to Pirkei Avos, and we're back to chapter three, continuing where we left off, which is with Mishnah number two. Uh, I probably said this before, but I'll say it again. Um, the Mishnayos are divided in different ways based on different editions. Uh, you know, in the actual text, it's uh, actually, I should probably open up Pirkei Avos here. Do I have it? Yeah. So like in Pirkei Avos, for example, um, we are doing the second Mishnah, which in this numbering goes all the way this far. Like it's this whole big block of text, but what I'm doing is I'm taking it one statement at a time. So here you see Rabbi Hanina ben Sakana Kohanim, then Rabbi Hanina ben, ben Tradion, which is a totally different statement. So I'm going to take it that way, uh, but that's why you have different numberings in Avos. Okay, so without further ado, let us translate uh, our Mishnah for tonight. Okay, uh, Avos 3 2, Rabbi Hanina Sakana Kohanim Omer. So Rabbi Hanina. Uh, I think Art Scroll likes, I haven't looked at it, but I think Art Scroll translates this as the, uh, the deputy of Kohanim. I don't think that's going to matter. That was just his title. It was basically like the second in, in charge of the Kohanim. Okay. Heve mispalo bishloma shel machus. She'il male mora'a ish esre'ehu chayim bala'o. Anyone want to try to translate that? He would daven for the peace of the kingdom. Okay, good. So daven, uh, this is a tzivoy, daven for the peace of the, uh, I'm going to go ahead and leave it um, just as a transliteration right now. Kingdom is a fine translation, but I just want to leave it like that. Yeah. She ilmale mora'a. Ilmale is kind of a funny word. If it is not filled with, or if we were not filled Very with. Very close. It doesn't have to do with filling. I don't even know where the, uh, what that etymology is, but. Were it not for Mora'ah? Oh, fear. Yeah, fear of it. Ish esre'ehu chayim bala'o. Each man would swallow his friend alive? Yeah, each man would swallow... Neighbor? His friend alive. Friend. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, did someone say something, a uh, different translation? No? I'm just not great with you. I thought Ray was neighbor. Uh, it could be people translate as neighbor. I mean, in fact, better. Um, be, I like the better translation of fellow because friend in English like implies, you know, like social friends and Re'ehu is just your fellow Jew, you know, or your fellow human being. Okay. Okay. So that's what he would say. Now you'll notice I uh, have here two versions of the Mishnah. So this is just a little methodology point, which I don't know how significant it is. It could be extremely significant or it could be not because I just kind of discovered this. So if you go on, uh, on Allah Torah, they have the regular Mishnah, and then they have something called uh, Mishnah's Ksav Yad Kaufman, okay? And I looked this up, Mishnah Kaufman Manuscript, and Wikipedia says, the Kaufman Manuscript is a complete Hebrew manuscript of the Mishnah. It is part of the collection of David Kaufman, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is a complete manuscript of all six orders of the Mishnah. It was written in the 10th or 11th century, probably in the land of Israel or perhaps in Italy. The text includes di diacritics, which is Nukadot. However, the letters Nukadot uh, were not done with the same author. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, different things. Uh, here, here's the significant point. As demonstrated by Yechezkel Kutcher, the Kaufman manuscript is the most complete early manuscript of the Mishnah that has survived. It retains the original forms of the language as it was spoken by Chazal in the second century, not mixing in biblical forms. This language belongs to the Western dialect of the language of the sages, that is to say the dialect used in the land of Israel, as opposed to the Babylonian dialect. So again, the whole reason why Alatora was started is to, to make the most accurate manuscripts available for everybody. So the just so you know, for your own learning purposes, if you're going to use a Mishnah, and you want the earliest, you know, uh, uh, edition of the Mishnah, you go to Mishnah Ksav Yad Kaufman. Now, in our case, I don't think it makes any substantive difference because uh, the Kaufman says, Rabbi Hanina Sagana Kohanim Omer, Heve Mispalo Bishlama Shalamalchus. Okay, uh, for those who aren't familiar, Shell used to be a prefix, not a separate word. Okay, that's why this is the older version. Ilule Mora'a. Ilule is the same word as Ilmale, were it not for its fear. Ish Ezrehu Chaim Balanu. Uh, I don't think there's a difference between Balanu. I mean, I know it sounds like it's saying it would swallow us. Each of our fellows would swallow us, but I don't think the meaning is different. Okay, so here it doesn't make a difference. I just wanted to let you know that I discovered that this week. And uh, and sometimes, by the way, you will get a uh, substantive difference in um, in uh, 
the, the text of the Mishnah. For example, I'm just going to quote an example, even though this is off topic. Um, this famous statement of, I haven't even checked this out yet. Uh, Antignos Isoho in chapter one, Mishnah Gimel says, so he says in the standard editions of the Mishnah, do not be like servants who serve their master with the intent to receive a prize. Rather, be like servants who serve their master without the intent to receive a prize. Okay. Now, if you look at the Rishonim, you'll find some Rishonim have this text, like Rabbeinu Yonah, but other Rishonim say, not shalo almanas le kabo pras, but almanas shalo le kabo pras, with the intention to not receive a reward. And that's how the Ramam has it. And so you look at the Kalfman, let's see what it says. Ella have you cut of him, Hamsham Shimis Rav, almanas shalo le kabo pras. So it has it like the Rambam, you know? So sometimes it does make a difference. Methodology, uh, you know, just so you know. Okay, back to the regularly scheduled programming. Okay, that's our Mishnah, very short. Uh, what are the questions? I feel like there's not going to be as many questions as the last mission we did. And the translation you wrote, were it not for fear of it? Yeah. Okay. The not, word not isn't there. That's why I'm confused. Oh, we're, sorry, sorry. Yeah, were it not. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Lauren? Um, why, what is this doing in Perky Abos? Like, it seems like everybody okay. should be davening for the government. Oh, interesting. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so you could ask this question in two ways, right? You could say, what is this doing in, in Pirkei Avos? Okay, uh, and I'm going to just add in our premise here. This is our, the, our working methodology, which I probably explained in the first year, is um, that, uh, which is primarily intended, sorry, whose primary audience, sorry, <laughs> the primary audience of which is people who are working on becoming uh, Hasidim, okay, uh, i.e. extra righteous, okay? So the way Lauren asked the question was, shouldn't everyone daven for the peace of the Malchus? Okay, um, what was I thinking? Is there another way you can ask that question? What is this doing in Pirkei Avos? I mean, I guess like what do state matters have to do with? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, right. Is that... Um, uh, or alternatively, what does this what does this uh, like uh, directive about davening have to do with like ethics, right? I mean, on the surface, like you know, have a book about tefillah, right? Pirkei Avos typically does not give you tefillah advice. Uh, it gives you advice about how to like actually like behave with people, you know, you know, conduct yourself with other people. So either way, those are good questions. Okay, next. What does it mean each man would swallow his fellow alive? Okay, what is meant by each man would swallow his fellow alive? And unless this is writing for uh, pythons, uh, and <laughs> then you can't, this is not to be taken literally, right? So this is a muscle. Uh, so the question is like, what does this mean? So, uh, sorry, what does it mean? And why does it express itself in this particular figure of speech? Because I, the other thing also is like, you know, if you're talking about like interpersonal violence, I feel like swish, swish, fish swallowing each other is not like the first thing I think of. I would say like, you know, each man would tear his fellow to pieces or like, I don't know, like something more violent, like fish in the sea does not like, is not the first thing that comes to mind. Maybe that's just me. Yeah, Vanessa? Um. We assume that Malchut means government, but could it mean like, I don't know, Malchut of Hashem? Okay. What, how are we defining Malchut? Okay, good question. So what does Malchus mean here? Okay, and let's break it down into all the possibilities. Okay, so so first thing, distinction Vanessa is making is, uh, does this um, mean human Malchus or even um, uh, Hashem's Malchus? Okay. Uh, spoiler alert, every commentary I've seen says it means human malchus, okay, but that doesn't mean that that you can't say Hashem malchus, and then if it means uh, human malchus, so what are the, what would you say the, the main, major possibilities are? I guess, like, do we pray even for American government, or do we just pray for, like, back in the times of Basin Mikdash, like... Oh, okay, good question, okay, so do, is this referring to 
is this referring even uh, just to Jewish uh, malchus or even non-Jewish? Okay, any other subdivisions we can have here? Um, so you notice that only actually yes, yeah. uh, only the one you're living in, which sounds silly, but like okay, no, that's could a good you question. pray for okay. peace in the Middle East? Okay, is this referring only to the malchus uh, you are in, or every malchus? Okay, uh, and then uh, Ayala trans oh, malchus Ayala translated this as government, right? What's the literal translation? Kingdom. Yeah. Oh, sorry. She didn't translate as government. She translates kingdom. Yeah. So does this mean like kingdom, i.e. Uh, with like in a monarchy? Okay. Or does this mean uh, government? Okay. Because th this is, you know, Malchus is often used as government also, right? Um, okay. Any, any other possibilities I'm leaving out? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot, but like. Well, I, I mean, want to ask a question of like, sorry about the baby um Davin for a piece of Malchus and then like um swallow his fellow alive it kind of just feels like those are two separate things like two separate two separate subjects pasted together so like why like why is it like that does that make sense okay yeah so I'm gonna I'll, I'll list that as a separate question here which is that what is the relationship between sorry what is the cause and effect relationship cause and effect relationship because it's positing a cause and effect relationship between fear of the malchus uh and each man follow uh swallowing swallowing his fellow alive yeah yeah i think my question was similar to dina's and that i was going to ask like why davin for peace it sounds like it would make more sense for power if we're okay for fear okay. so, so good good Okay, so the one who asked that question, uh, I, I put this here in case someone asked it. The Abravanel says, um, okay, it oh, looks like he spoils a question also. He says, is it proper, sorry, it is proper to analyze two things in this Mishnah. First, why does he say the peace of the government rather than the peace of the king? Okay, so he does seem to be taking it as like, this is talking about a monarchy. So why limit it, or why, why, um, broaden i guess to the entire uh malchus not just the melech okay uh i i don't think that's uh such a strong question but i'll, I'll add this here okay uh if it means means uh monarchy um why not daven for the monarch okay like famously you know god save the queen god save the king right and then the second question is what y'all asked which is um, second, if he said Davin for its peace, why did he say, because were it not for fear of it, didn't he command us to Davin for its peace and not for fear of it? It would have been appropriate to say, were it not for the peace of the government or to say Davin for the fear of the government, because were it not for fear of it. Okay. So the question is, um, further, I'm going to add this here. Furthermore, um, if what matters is fear of the government, why daven for peace okay and if we're davening for peace does that necessarily imply that we'll get fear right like it it's two separate uh, two separate things okay good question yeah vanessa i don't know if i have the same question and it's just reworded but yeah why if we're thinking about this in a Jewish context, like this isn't a directive given to everyone, it's a directive given to Jews. Why should we care about the government at all? Like, why shouldn't we okay. be focused? Like, what shouldn't we have an be ambivalent? Okay, so the interesting thing is that um, that the Mishnah is explicitly trying to address that question, which is, were it not for fear of it, then each man will swallow his fellow alive. However, because we also wonder what government are we talking about here. I think that will have a bearing on your question. In other words, if you're talking about the government you live in, so then it's answering your question. But if you're talking about other governments, then it's not so simple, right? I guess my question is more like, why aren't we just telling people to not swallow their fellows alive regardless of how the government's doing? Okay. Like, okay. Does sure. that make so, more sense? Okay, sure, sure. So so why, uh, like, uh, let me, how, would, how would we formulate this? Why are we, like, taking it for granted that a fellow, like, Okay. That our well-being. That's a good question. The government. Okay. Why are we taking it for? Sorry. It, let's just say it like this. Okay. Uh, is is it really true 
that were it not for fear of the gov of the malchus, um, each man would swallow his fellow alive. Like, um, and if not, why not just daven that each person not swallow his fellow alive, right? Cut out the middleman, middle government. Yeah, good question. Yeah, Ayla? So more methodology-wise, should yeah. it matter to us that it was the deputy of Kohanim who says this? And it's <laughs> okay. like a leadership type That's of a great question. Okay, so um, there are two Mepharshim I'm aware of who... Uh, start off their commentary on each Mishnah and Avos by going into the biography of the person who said it, okay? The Rosh Bats does this and the Abravanel does this. And they will often, um, uh, oh, and actually, let me just give a little commercial break, hold on. There's a book I'm going to recommend. Uh, I haven't read the whole thing because there are four of them, but there's a book called The Sages by Binyamin Lau. And there are four volumes and they go by uh, historical um, uh, era. And at least the first two volumes, I think, or maybe it's just the first one. No, I think it's the first, I don't know. What he does is he goes, well, it's at least the first one. He goes through, um, uh, he has like uh, portraits of individual Tanaim and Amoraim and explains their teachings in their historical context. Okay, like he'll talk about like, um, like I, I don't think he does this one, but like um, he'll say, for example, you know, um, he doesn't do this one. I actually should have looked at this beforehand. Okay, if he did this one, he would say, you know, what time period did Rabbi Hanina live in? You know, what was the state of the Kohanim at the time? You know, and was he saying this like in, in uh, you know, in, in response to like the circumstances, you know? And uh, so it sounds like the Rashbats and the Abravanel are doing stuff like that. And they might say that the fact that it's the deputy of the Kohanim is important. I personally uh, don't like uh, look for that kind of thing, mostly because I don't really know the information. And also, uh, even when I read their commentaries, I don't necessarily always read it. Like I didn't read it when I was preparing for this. Uh, I just went to the ideas. So it's a good methodology question. Uh, I don't have an answer that would be useful for our purposes here. Yeah. And it's the, the simple answer is that was just, uh, you know, there are multiple Rabbi Haninas, and this is, it's talking about Rabbi Hanina, the Sagan of the Kohanim, you know, just to identify him. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, like I said, this is, I think this is a fairly straightforward, um, not that the meaning is straightforward, but like it's not, not a terribly complicated uh, Mishnah. Okay, so uh, before we do Mepharshim, anyone want to try to answer any of these questions here? Um, so can I try? Yeah, go ahead. So I might answer my own question, but, okay. um, and like maybe answer um question three at the same time possibly mm -hmm. so like if we're referring to let's say like the american government or something like that or like yeah. parliament or something yeah um maybe the reason why those these two things are together like um swallow man alive and daven for the peace of the government is so that like it's like when we daven in shul we say like the beraha on behalf of the government or like the the our state or something like that so like you know pray that the government does the right thing so that people don't go wild and crazy uh. and that they pass the right rules not to swallow people alive like don't kill them or anything like that or steal from them or rob them does that make sense I, okay I don't know. so so a couple of things first of all um the reason why we say that thing in shul i think is because of this okay um, so we can't like use that as a proof, you know, like, um, secondly, it is interesting that we're not davening that the government not uh, do, you know, engage in acts of violence. We're saying that the government should have peace so that people will fear it so that people don't do violence to each other, which is an interesting question, right? Like, why don't we, why don't we daven for the government to, so, okay, the third point I was going to make, which is going to address this, is a, there's a major question we forgot, right? What does... Shalom, um, Shalmalchus 
even mean, right? What are, what exactly are we davening for? Right. In fact, like peace of the government is the literal translation, but like, does it mean well-being? Does it mean like, like well-functioning? And furthermore, another question, which I'm going to tack on to um, number three. Okay. This could be a separate question. Actually, you know, I'm going to make it a separate question. Okay. What if the Malchus is evil, right? In fact, we Davin, um, uh, I mean, it's not as explicit in um, the uh, Nusach Ashkenaz, but I'll show you in the Ramam's Nusach of Tefillah. Uh, you know what, I'm going to use all Mechon um, Mamre because it's easier to find. Actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to be, I'm going to be principled here. Use the correct best edition. Uh, say for Ava, say for Tefillah. Let's look here. Um, oopsies, remove. Um, hold on. In the bracha, in the Shimon Esrei of Vlamal Shinim, we say like this. So this is in the Ramam's version. He says, Lamashumadim uh, Altihi Tikva to the um, uh, apostates, there should be no hope. Kol aminim, all the heretics, karega yovedu, should be destroyed in an instant. Umalchus zadon ta'akor v'sishbor, mehera b'amino. And the, the um, like, maliciously evil government, you should uproot and break quickly in our days. That doesn't sound like praying for the uh, shalom of the malchus, right? It sounds like for the destruction of the malchus. So the question is, um, what if the malchus is evil, right? Should we, so uh, on the one hand, we do daven for the destruction of the evil malchus. Where else? Uh, where else do we daven for that? Uh, in um, other than the daily shmon right? Anyone know? I have to go to Sfaria for this because they don't have liturgy here. On Rosh Hashanah. And Yom Kippur, uh, Rosh Hashanah. The, yeah, yeah. The, we say it on tribes. I don't know what Ashkenazim do. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so in the uh, in the um, third bracha of the Shemona Esrei in Kedusha, um, we say uh, in, the, in the extended Kedusha bracha. Um, let's see. Da, da, da. I'm not imagining this, am I? <laughs> Hold on. Printing uh, pastels. Oh yeah, Bukhola Risha Kulak Ashin Tikle, Ki Savir Mem Shellas Zadon Miharats. So all wickedness will uh dissipate like smoke when you remove the evil sovereignty from the uh from the uh the earth, right? So we do Davin for um for the destruction of the uh of evil Malchus, okay. Um uh on the other hand, oh, sorry, on the other hand, uh on the other hand, the Mishnah here is unqualified, implying that it includes an evil Malchus. Okay, so going back to Dina's question, um, so uh, it's true that we daven in shul for the welfare of the government, but uh, there we daven for them to like, you know, um, be wise and righteous and all this other stuff here. The question though is what are we davening for here? What does shalom shalmachus mean? And it does not sound like we're davening for the, the machus not to mistreat us. We're davening for the machus to have shalom so that people will fear it, so that people will not uh, swallow each other alive. So what about davening for the machus not to be corrupt? A, a right. So, I mean, that sounds like a great tefillah, right? But that doesn't sound like shalom, you know. And and or or the question is like like how is that how is that shalom, you know? I would say the tov of the malchus if if we're davening for them to not be corrupt. Like in other words, shalom sounds to me like a low bar almost, you know, like that they should be in peace, not that they should be successful, not that they should be functioning, not that they should be righteous, you know, that they should be at peace, which is interesting that we even target that. Yeah, Ayala. Um, okay, I don't know if this is what you asked at the last question of question three. Yeah. But does malchus like necessarily mean, just like the word doesn't mean like 
the ruling power it doesn't mean like society under that kingship like can it mean that or no good question it's a good question good what i'm trying to think i mean it definitely does mean the ruling power but i'm what i'm trying to think of is do we ever use it in the other way like the word definitely means like rulership you know by a king or rulership in general but uh i don't know if we use it that way it's a good question i'm not sure because like this piece of it you're saying like it means peace within the government let's say yeah like it means within the government it doesn't mean like amongst the people and the government right okay. yeah from what i've seen in the mafarshim that i looked at then it's all talking about rulers whether kings or like other rulers it's not talking about the uh the resulting society because the resulting society is uh is the uh person swallowing his fellow alive okay anyone else have any other steps or ideas or approaches we got a lot of mafarshim which uh we don't have to go through all of them tonight but uh uh, a lot of ideas here. Okay, so th the first idea I want to say is uh, I listened to Rabbi Chait's uh, shir on, on this Pirkei Avos thing, and uh, the, the first thing he said before he went into the Mepharshim um, is answering Vanessa's question about... Um, is this really true that we're not for fear of Malchus, even if man will swallow his fellow alive? Okay, so Rabbi Chait said it in kind of like a shock, shocking way. He said... You learn three things from this Mishnah. One, um, human beings are, are intrinsically evil. Two, human beings are not aware of it. And three is people attribute, attribute their doing good to other things. Okay, so let's break it down. Human beings are intrinsically evil. Okay, that what this is saying is if, is, is if it weren't for the government, you would just go and just kill your fellow human being, right? So now, basically, he's treating this Mishnah as like a treatment for anarchy. Like, yes, it is. So, <clears throat> so the, this Mishnah um, is the definitive statement on Judaism's position about anarchy, which is that anarchy is worse than uh, a uh, uh, even Problem. a non-ideal machus. Yeah, yeah. And and if you ever if you have any libertarian friends, it's fun to bring this Mishnah up to them and see what they say, uh, because uh, you know, like, uh, and I've I've done this, you know, but um. Uh, so, um, but, but I mean, well, sorry, sorry, let me back up. When I say Judaism's position, we don't know if this is Judaism's, Judaism's position. This is Rabbi Hanina Sagan Kohanim's position, right? That's clear. Okay. Yeah, Dina? So it's actually very funny that you mentioned it because I was just talking to my husband about it. And he's like, yes, this Mishnah is anti-anarchy. And um, I was like, oh, I was just about to mention it to you. But yeah, you already said it without me saying Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so um, so uh, when I first heard the statement of this shows that man is intrinsically evil, it's funny. I don't know if this is just me. I don't know if any of you had this reaction. My, my gut reaction was to say, that's not true. Like, that's not what the Torah's belief is. And then I realized, like, in this week's Parsha, it says it, right? Anyone know what I'm referring to? Yeah, right? I mean, it's, it's an open puzzle, right? Uh, let me just show it to you here. Uh, in um, it's actually after the flood, right? Um, when Hashem uh, says he's not going to destroy the world again. Uh, the, um, this is in uh, Breshis 8.21. Hashem uh, sm uh, smelled the pleasing fragrance. Uh, God willing, I will write a one-page article on that phrase uh, before Shabbos. Okay, so stay tuned. I I've written the draft. The question is, am I going to get it out in time? The Yom Hashem Alivo, and Hashem said uh, to himself, meaning he didn't say it to a Navi, Lo osif odes adama adam. I will no, uh, not again curse the earth because of man. Ki yitzir adam raminura, because the, the inclination of man's heart is evil from his youth. And this is the mach locus between uh, Rabbi Yehuda and, uh, and Antoninus, who some say is, Rabbi, is Marcus Aurelius, uh, that um, we don't know this for sure, um, that there was mach locus, but when does the Yitzhahara enter into a person? So I believe Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi said um, uh, it enters into him from, uh, wait, I'm mixing it up, scratch that. There is a mock looks about when the uh, Yatar enters, but the, the, this, is, uh, this would seem to suggest that from youth, I think it's Rashi say here, uh, Minu Rav, yeah. So Rashi takes a stance, I'm gonna sneeze, maybe. Hold on. Okay, not anymore, on. you're not. Not anymore. Minu'urav, uh, mina'arav, Steve, is written from his na'arav, 
which means his like stirrings. Once he's stirring to get out of his uh, mother's womb, then he gets the Yitzhahara. So it is saying man is intrinsically evil. Okay, not intrinsically in the sense that you're doomed to evil, but that that's how you start off. Okay, so that was a uh, uh, Rabbi Chait's first point that were it not for government, then man would um uh would um would uh would you know victimize his fellow. And by the way, if you uh haven't read the book, uh, Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, uh, sorry, Man's Search for Meaning by Victor Frankl. Uh, it's good to read every once in a while. I reread it over the summer maybe. And, uh, and one of the things he talks about there is like how in a, you know, when you are in an environment like a concentration camp, um, like the raw, you know, animalistic nature of human beings come out. And he, he tells, I mean, to me, it was the most uh, heart-wrenching story about like the, uh, the father who like, you know, uh, had bread and like his son spotted him and the son like killed his father to get the extra bread. And the father was trying to say like, son, like I got an extra piece of bread for you, you know? Uh, and like, even people like who are, or let's say like in the Torah itself, you know, talking about women, uh, eating their own children, you know, like when push comes to shove, human beings are animals, you know? Um, that's what this mission is saying. Okay. Not a very like optimistic thing. Secondly, the second point Rabbi Chait brought out of this is that people don't know this. Okay. What's the proof of the mission that people aren't aware of this fact? That it's here. That it's here, right? That the mission has to tell you to daven for the government because otherwise you fall, swallow your fellow alive. Right. And then the third point that, uh, Rabbi Chait brought out is, is he said that people aren't aware of this. I mean, which is, you know, conceptually it's the same as the second point, but rhetorically, if you went to another person and said, like, you go to, go to some like, um, like, uh, yeah, go to, go to some like, like average person and say, hey, why aren't you knocking over that old woman and stealing her purse? The person would say, I would never, I would never do anything like that, you know? But, you know, in a uh, uh, change of scenario, you know, apocalyptic, uh, you know, uh, a Mad Max uh, world or whatever, like maybe you would do that, you know, uh, if, if, if you're, if you're going to get away with it. So, so th that, that was the, uh, those were the first points that Rabbi Chait made before he went to the Mepharshim. Okay. Any, any questions on that? I, yeah. Ayala? Yeah. I mean, I know I said like, because it's here, that's why, yeah. I mean, that could be a proof, but like, I feel like there are a lot of things which Chazal say or Chatora say, which like we could maybe come to with our logic or like people do know. It's not like no one knows this and it's, right. that's why it's there. Yeah, right. But here's the thing, though, is even the people who know this, how many people, A, daven for the government, and B, daven for the government for this reason? You know, like, I think that most, first of all, I, I think I said this in the sheer description in the email, that I think <laughs> if you ask, like, I, I can't say outside of America, but most Americans, okay, are only going to daven for the government if it's their side, right? Like, they're, 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 they might like say Amen to the Bracha and Shul, you know, but like most of them are not davening for the government uh, that is of the party that they don't vote, vote for. And even when they do, they're not voting for it for this reason, right? And I, he's not saying that this is the only reason that you should daven for it, but I think this reason doesn't even enter into people's minds, you know? So I, I, I think that that's the, uh, that, that even if, if on some level we know this, uh, he's saying daven for it, which means view it as a good that like you are actively wanting and asking God to bring into into actuality, you know, and like, and not just, you know, we've talked about tefillah, not in this year, but in other shirim, you know, when you daven for something, it's not just that you are making a wish on a birthday cake in order for your tefillah to actually like um, have an impact. You have to be internalizing the values that you are, asking God to, uh, you know, to, to, to materialize, you know, like, I don't think people really like do that, uh, for, for this reason, you know? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on these points or can we go into the Mepharshim? Can I ask one question? Yeah, sure. Sorry, I had to, I had to go for a few minutes, but so you're saying everybody Chait says that we should Davin for the peace, because if not, like, how does he explain the people swallowing each other up? So he again? said that like, people are intrinsically, the way he said is people are intrinsically evil. I would, I would counter it and say people are intrinsically, um, uh, intrinsically animalistically selfish. Okay. Like that's the default setting and you have to like rise above that. And that the thing that's holding it at bay is fear of punishment from whatever authority is going to be able to administer punishment, you know? And that's why I think that can partially answer question three, which is according to at least what Rabbi Shade is saying, it doesn't necessarily mean monarchy. 
And it doesn't even necessarily mean government, like in the sense of like, you know, uh, you know, the, you know, the seat of power of the United States. It, it even extends to like, you know, shoftim and shotrim, you know, like enforcers of the law, you know, um, because that's what prevents people from doing this. And by the way, you see, not to get political, but like you see um, in, um, you know, there've been like uh, uh, movements of like abolishing the police, right? Um, and in, I mean, I'm speaking of this not from personal experience, but from, you know, Seattle, where I'm from, you know, that was one of the cities that like was very, very uh, into that, right? And cities like Seattle and San Francisco, certain areas where the police, you know, uh, either were, were weakened or where they don't go, there is like law, lawlessness and anarchy and like, like, you know, people just breaking into stores and stealing stuff. I mean, to what extent, you know, that, that, that you have to do your own research on, but like, this does happen, you know, or I'll give you another example, like, you know, as those of you who know my brother, Johnny, you know, world traveler. So he's always talking about how there's, um, you know, he loves going to Africa, but he's saying, he says that there's easy Africa and hard Africa. Okay. Uh, easy Africa uh, are, you know, countries with like, that are relatively safe, have stable governments, you know, first world or like moving there. But then there's places, hard Africa, like, uh, I don't know, exact examples, like, like, I don't know, like South you know, Sudan or whatever, you know, uh, uh, Congo, that like, in some of these places, there is no government, like the place is just run, like some places, there's literally no government. And other places, there is like nominally a government, but it's really just run by like, hordes of, 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 of like warlords and people who are in power. And like, yeah, they'll just kill you in, and take your stuff. And even in like, um, we were talking recently over Sukkot, like, uh, you know, the most dangerous country Johnny has been to uh, is South Africa, you know, and, and I know for some of you who don't know that it might be shocking because like we know Jews from South Africa. I mean, all the Jews in South Africa live behind in gated communities. They have like police escorts to shul. And when Johnny was asking one of the South African Jews from our, um, our community, uh, like, uh, you know, any tips, he said, the guy said, um, if you get an Uber, don't sit in the back, sit in the front, because there is so much, um, uh, uh, like, uh, what do you call it, resentment towards Uber from like cab companies, that if they see that a car is functioning as an Uber, they will just break open the car and just steal your stuff, you know, or like, you know, like just while you're at stopped at a, at a light, just open the car and just take your stuff, you know, so sit in the front so that it doesn't look like it's an Uber, you know, so like, things like that, like, like this stuff goes on. And, uh, and, uh, and that's what I mean by like animalistically selfish. And, and it's not the government, it originates in the government that what stops this, but really on, on the street level, it's going to be people enforcing the law. Okay. And again, I'm not saying that all government and all police are good. I mean, clearly North Korea has police and that's bad. And so does Iran, you know, and that's part of the question here is like, are we really supposed to dive in for them? You know, uh, but that that's the, uh, the, the that was what Revachate meant, I think, about like evil, like animalistically selfish and like 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 they'll kill you to take your stuff if that's what it, it, it means, you know. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. One more example. Just I, it's hard to not give examples from from Johnny's travels is when Johnny went to Kenya, he went to the largest slum in Africa or the largest slum in Kenya. And uh, he has a video about this, which uh, which if you look on his channel. Um, I forgot what he called the video, but it's about Typhoon. He, he, he took a tour of the slums by this guy named Typhoon, who used to be like, you know, like Aladdin, like in Disney, like a street urchin, like happily like stealing loaves of bread. This was a guy, but like in Africa, who would like, like he, they would just go around and like, like steal pe from people and like kill people, you know? And, uh, and like he eventually reformed his behavior and like now is an upstanding citizen. But like, we just don't realize how lawless these, uh, these uh, you know, certain places are because we've we're born and raised most of us or all of us at least in this uh you know this uh, zoom thing we're raised in a country with a stable like government you know so it's, it's just crazy we take it for granted yeah ayala um do you think that like let's say i mean i like what you're saying it's hard to picture do you think that if there was no government or no police or whatever then like everyone would be doing these crazy things and like us included or would it yeah. be that some it would it be because no, like once it already happened once there are a few people stealing you can't not because then you're going to be the one who's like just stolen from all the time and murdered and whatever like just for survival yeah. okay like, 
So I'm going to actually answer that question through one of the Mepharshim, okay? So um, I'm going to, uh, so of the Mepharshim here, I like in my mind, I don't always do this. In my mind, there's like awards to give to the Mepharshim on the, this Mishnah. So best shot award to, for me goes to the Me'iri. Um, most impactful idea goes to Rubain and Yona. Most radical idea goes to Abravanel. Okay, those are the three I want to like focus on tonight, okay? So... Uh, the Abravanel says, um, no, not the Abravanel. The Meiri says, so far, this tractate has cautioned us about the respect and awe due to the wise. Um, okay, uh, he means so far in this tractate, meaning chapters one and two, okay? Um, this wise man uh, now informs us that one must join this with respect and fear of rulers, okay? Meaning just like you... Um, you have a respect and awe for the Chachamim, so too should have it for rulers, to the degree that he davens for their peace. For human leadership is divided into two divisions, Torah leadership, which is given to Chachamim, and political leadership, which is given to the rulers and judges. If the leadership of the Chachamim is lacking, it does not diminish political leadership. Okay, and what he means by that is, you know, we don't really have a situation where we have, like, clear, excellent Torah leadership, unfortunately, you know, but, like, that being said, the fact that we don't have that does not really affect the U.S. government, okay? But if political leadership is lacking, both of them will lack. For whenever there is no fear of the government, each man fears that his fellow will ambush him and plot against him, and all his time will be spent in anxiety and preoccupation with saving himself. This is why Rabbi Hanina goes to such an extreme, saying that one must daven for it. And this applies not only to the Jewish government, but also to the nations of the world. Uh, to the Umas Olam, to the non-Jews. For this is even alluded to for us by the Torah. I was going to give this year, by the way, on uh, the last Thursday before Sukkot, because it was relevant, but I ended up giving a year on, oh, I ended up not giving a year because I was traveling. Um, uh, and this is uh, uh, even alluded to us, uh, alluded, to, alluded to for us by the Torah in the midst of offering the 70 bulls of the festival of Sukkot, right? Um, that's the uh, diminishing the uh, parim for Musaf. Uh, which the sages expound to symbolize the 70 nations. And in the book of Ezra, it is written so that they may offer pleasing offerings to the God of heaven and pray for the lives of the king and his children. Okay, so, so what he's saying is there's two types of leadership. Torah leadership, we clearly value, right? That, that you need people to like teach Torah to the, to, to, to the Jewish people and to like reinforce the values and to make sure that we're all like aspiring to that. And then there's political leadership. And what he's saying the Chiddush of this Mishnah is, is that without political uh leadership you can't have torah leadership because in like if you imagine like maslow's hierarchy of needs but on a societal level you can't have a like torah leadership is really um functioning to uh <laughs> let me back up what's the difference between the purpose of taryag mitzvos and sheva mitzvos b'nei noach Right, they're two systems. They're both from God, but they cl they clearly have different objectives. I guess for the Noahide laws, it's more just like trying to make life on Earth conducive and like make it like not barbaric. Like you're not ripping limbs yeah, off yeah. of animals walking by, whereas like the mitzvot are just meant to like refine us further and to like spread exactly. like goodness. Okay, good. That's exactly what it is. And I the the best um, uh, statement of this that I have here is. Um, in uh, this is really the problem. In, I guess this is appropriate for Parshas Noach. This is the problem in the society before the Mabel is you know we, uh, you know we, we see the problem right, which is um, uh, that that uh, well Hashem says later on it was really um, Arios and uh, Avodazara and Hamas violent crime and it says uh, Hashem says this is kind of a spoiler for tomorrow. Remember Elokim Lenoch. Kate's Kol Basar Balafnai Kimal Hearts Hamas Mipnehem, that the end of all flesh has come before me because the earth has been filled with Hamas, with um, with violent crime uh, be before them. Is this the Rashi? Yeah. Yeah. Kimal Hearts Hamas. Rashi says, Kimal Hearts Hamas, Lone Nechtam Gazar Dinam Ella Al Hagezel. That even though there were these other crimes going on, then the, the fate was only sealed because of Gezel. Uh, because of theft, but if you look above, when Hashem was describing what happened, he says, "Lo yadon ruchi ba'adam la'olam ba'shagam hu basar," which is a difficult possible to translate. Hashem says, "Let's see how Nima Novetsky translates it." Hashem said, "My spirit will not reside in man forever, as he too is flesh." 
Okay, the Ralbag though translates it differently, which is, does he put it here? Yeah, he says, um, lo yadun is mi'inyan din umishpat, which means to rule. So my spirit will not rule over man. And he says, ruhi, hu ruach adam asher hu ba adam. This is the spirit of man, which makes him man, which is the intellect. And it's ascribed to Hashem because it comes from him. So the way the Rabbah reads it is, my spirit will no longer rule man, which means that the intellect will no longer rule human beings. Bishagam hu basar. And he said, I'm not going to read it in the Rabbah right now. He says, because... Basically, man's animalistic nature was being overwhelmed by the Tzal Melukim. And basically what would have happened is when that happens on an individual level, then, okay, worst comes to worst, you basically are like an animal and you make bad decisions and you destroy yourself and harm the people around you. Okay, that's worst comes to worst. But on a societal level, there's like a tipping point. Once it gets to the point where the majority of human beings are just living like animals, then the Tzal Melukim can no longer assert itself. And the proof is that God had to destroy the world in order to like restart humanity. And my understanding of Shema Mitzvah B'nai Noach is to prevent that from happening on a societal level. Um, and whereas the Tariq Mitzvah is to refine us, like Vanessa said, and to bring us to true human perfection, which is knowledge of God to the extent possible. You know, so, um, so, uh, so the point is that on, in Maslow's hierarchy of needs on society, you can't engage in Torah leadership and making a Torah society if each person is afraid that the neighbor is going to break down his door and steal his stuff, you know, and all of your energy just gets uh, occupied in survival and protection from your fellow man, you know. So, Ayala, that was one possibility you mentioned, right, which is that that you're just going to be like, in order to compete, you know, you're going to have to like maybe if people are going to steal your food, maybe you're going to have to steal people's food also, you know, to survive. But what that's going to do is it's going to corrupt your values and make it so that you can't even think about um, uh, uh, developing like the values and ideas of Torah. You know, um, this is this reminds me of an idea that uh, I might have said to people who were my students at the time that I was reading the um, the biography of Yonmi Park, um, who escaped North Korea, you know, and um, she was saying how uh, when she escaped from North Korea, she didn't escape to find freedom. She said they didn't even know what freedom was. There's just no concept. She was escaping to find food, you know? And all she knew was that food, there's no food in North Korea and you got to get out to get food. And I brought this in in the context of in the, uh, the uh, 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 Seder, when you tell Sibur Yitzhiz Mitzrayim, there's two, you know, stories you have to tell. You have to tell the story of physical slavery to physical freedom and spiritual slavery to spiritual freedom. But, you can't have the spiritual freedom without uh, breaking free from the physical slavery. Like if all you're concerned with is like survival and your basic needs, you can't think about higher values, you know? So I think it is a slightly more subtle idea that like your values, the values you view as intrinsic to yourself, like if you view yourself as a kind person or someone who like, you know, is helpful or generous, you only have those values because you came of age in a society that wasn't anarchical with people cut at each other's throats, and that's due to the government, you know? Uh, so it's not intrinsic to you. It's because you live in a society where you are, you don't have to worry about that kind of like self-preservation, and then you can develop these other values, you know? And that's what I like about the Meiri, because he's saying like, like, you know, recognize that these things you take for granted are not really part of you, and you really, you know, everyone will say I value Torah, but they won't say I value the welfare of the government because they don't realize that the government is necessary for them to value Torah, you know? Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's the Miri. Any questions on that? Okay. Now for the most impactful idea that I read, which is Rabinu Yonah. Okay. Um, he says like, so he had a slightly different text of the Mishnah, which is Rabbi Hanania, or sorry, yeah, Rabbi Hanania, not Rabbi Hanina. Uh, Deputy of the Kohanim says, Daven for the peace of the government, because were it not for the fear of it, which is harsh on us. He adds in the word, Shuhu Kashal, you know, that's what his version had. Each man would swallow his fellow alive. Okay. This means to say that a person should daven for the peace of the entire world and to feel pain over the pain of others. So in Hebrew, that is, Shish uh, la'adam lahis pala al shalom kol ha'olam ulahitz ta'ir al tsa'ar shalacherim. Right? To have, I always forget which one's empathy and which one's sympathy. 
Uh, this is empathy or sympathy, where you feel pain over the pain of others, or is empathy, there a difference? Empathy, I think. Okay. Sympathy. Empathy is when you get down in the hole with them. Uh, okay. Sympathy is like pity. Yeah, right. Um, okay, that's the one. Such is the way of tzaddikim, as David said, but as for me, when they were ill, my clothing was sackcloth, and I afflicted myself with fasting, may my prayer return upon my own bosom. And I, I don't remember the exact context here. Let me just check it up. I meant to look at this ahead of time. I believe he was talking about his enemies. Um, let me just see if I can get the context really quickly. Tell him 35, 13. Um, yeah, I think he is talking. Uh, yeah, so he says, um, yeah, false witnesses rise up against me. For that of which I know nothing, they call me to account. They repay me evil for good, bereavement for my soul. But as for me, when they were ill, my clothing was sackcloth and I afflicted myself with fasting. May my prayer return upon my own bosom. So he's saying like, these guys are my enemies and they're trying to destroy me, but I'm still feeling empathy and praying for them. Okay. For a person should not make his supplications and requests for his own needs alone, but should dive in that all humanity should be in a state of peace. And with the peace of the government, there will be peace for the world. Okay, so this answers Vanessa's question also. Should you dive in for the whole world? According to Rebbeinu Yonah, yes. But the interesting thing, so it's interesting is that he's, uh, he's making this into, first of all, he's answering our question about what this is doing in Pirkei Avos. What is this doing in Pirkei Avos? This is the way of Siddiquim, to pray for everyone. And for, yeah, for the, this is an actual, this has an ethical uh, uh, dimension to it. In other words, this is not essentially tefillah advice. This is essentially how to develop good mitos advice. And you develop good mitos by davening for the whole world, okay? But the interesting thing is, to me, is that um, I think the approach in, uh, I don't know if it's Western society or America. I'll just say America because I don't really know outside of America. What's the, how would you describe the approach to cultivating empathy in America? Like, if you said, how should I develop empathy? What would people advise you who, like, advise on these things what should you do like work in a soup kitchen yeah why 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 is working in a soup kitchen because then you'll see the needs of others and like be in a position where you can see like oh hey i could this is what needs fixing exactly right so you're coming in close contact with people and i think it's a little bit more than than uh seeing what needs fixing which is more of a like pragmatic thing i think it's seeing like it's identifying with their humanity like oh this person is just like me this could be me, you know, it's identification. So in, in, uh, in the American method of, of cultivating empathy, it's cultivated through identification, right? The obstacle with that is gonna be, what's gonna be the obstacle with that method? Yeah, Alex? Um, well, I mean, when it comes down to it, America is a very individualistic society. So even when you're like trying to empathize with others, it's through the lens of like yourself. Okay, so the, the, the uh, yeah, hold on a second. Mm. The, uh, the downside of trying to cultivate empathy through the self is that the self is a limitation, right? Is that since it's only through the lens of the self, if you find a person who you can't identify with, right? So then there's no empathy, right? So what I find, and I'm not saying that, I'm not, I'm not uh, what do you call it? I'm not invalidating that method. I think there's definitely like a lot of, um, of benefit in that method. What I find interesting is the method that Ruby uh, Hanania is advocating according to Ruby Yona is the most abstract method there is, right? Is your davka not focusing on individuals, you're focusing on societies and davening not for individual people to have their needs taken care of, but for like the governments to be stable so that there could be peace in the world, you know? And I, I don't know what to make of that. It's just, it's a, a completely like, it's a different road, road to cultivating empathy, you know? It's very abstract, you know, to me, which which might also be why this is in Pirkei Avos, because not I don't think everyone is capable of this. I think everyone is capable of having, unless you're a sociopath, everyone is capable of the empathy of seeing someone who is and then identifying with them and then feeling, you know, your own feelings that are like uh, awakened by like the the common humanity. That could be for everybody, you know. That's like a kamocha, like the fact that this is a fellow Jew or like you know covered abrios. This is a fellow human being that I think we can all access. This is a much higher level. Like you really need to understand how essential governments are, and uh, and the other thing also is like you know um, he's not saying this, but um, but even people don't even realize how like 
what goes on in other parts of the world affects us. Like, I think, you know, uh, I, I know it's already moved out of the news cycle a lot, but like, you know, when, uh, when the war with Ukraine first started, I saw a lot of people saying like, who cares? Like, that's just Ukraine, you know? And then once like their, their, uh, their, uh, you know, gas prices or wheat prices or supply chain, like stuff, you know, got affected, then like, oh, well now I care about it. You know, like, you see that even when, in terms of like uh, conflicts from other governments that affect people, it, they can't, they, they don't care about it until it affects them. So this is asking for you to care about this, even when it doesn't affect you, you know, um, just for, for world peace. And so it's a very, very high, like, uh, that's a high bar, you know? I, I said that when you first read it, it sounds like Shlom Shlom Malkus is a low bar. It's actually a very high bar if you're talking about empathy. Yeah. I don't, I think, I think people are capable of it. I think it's empirical Alba because it's difficult and it's like something you have to strive for and it's like an yeah. ethical yeah. thing you have to pursue. But like, I was also thinking of Russia while this entire Mishnah and like, a lot of times I've caught even myself being like, I wish someone would just like get rid of Putin. But like, I don't even feel comfortable saying that because it's like, uh, that would just cause more anarchy and like something else would yeah. happen. Like, yeah. what people right. actually want is for Putin to magically wake up and be like, wow, annexing the Ukraine and causing all this war is actually really bad and just like to be peace. Like, yeah, it actually yes. solves all the problems of the Mishnah for me. Like, this makes more se- Like, I don't know. I like that this ties it together. Like, you're just praying for like peaceable governments. Yeah, and, like, yeah. Working exactly. together. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's going to, uh, let's, speaking of Putin, <laughs> let's segue to Sforno. Okay, I know I didn't mention Sforno, I mentioned the Abravanel. Uh, Sforno says, oh, hold on just a second. Yeah, Sforno says, um, he addresses the Putin question, okay? AFLP, oh, so even though the king is sometimes unfit, as has happened with the majority of kings during the Second Temple era, which, by the way, I have this uh, English um, uh, Sforno and Pirkei Avos, which is translated by Rabbi Palkovitz. Um, uh, and the footnote in Rabbi Pogovitz says, there are scholars who believe that Sforno's reference to kings in the Second Temple era is a euphemism for rulers who reigned in his day, okay? Uh, however, since freedom of expression in the Middle Ages was not overly tolerated, he tactfully used the euphemistic phrase kings in the, temple, the Second Temple era, which I'm just realizing now, we should totally like do that, that like when you are like uh, on social media posting about like uh, someone in the government that you don't like, just call them kings in the se- Second Temple era, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like wink, wink. Um, yeah. So, um, so anyway, he says, uh, even though the king is sometimes unfit, as happened with the majority of the kings in the Second Temple era, and perhaps he will steal and rob, nevertheless, it is proper to daven for his peace. For then he will instill his fear, and other people will not think it's okay to steal from one another. And through this, the violent crime will be removed from the masses of the nation. So he's answering the question of, granted, if it's a good king, then of course you should daven for, for uh, his, oh, sorry, for, let me back up. First of all, he is taking Malchus as kingship, not as government, right? Because he's saying he's he's saying it's synonymous with king. Secondly, he's he's saying that if it's a good king, then certainly you should pray for his peace. But the Chiddush is even if it's a bad king, because even a bad king in many cases is going to be better than anarchy. And again, that's that's the position of this Mishnah, whether you uh, uh, disagree with it, like duke it out with, uh, you know, with, with libertarian philosophy or whatever, but, uh, but, you know, he's, uh, he's, you know, it's actually Rabbi Chait quoted the Rav, quoted Rav Soloveitchik, saying that when you're davening for this and it's a bad government, you really are davening for the lesser of two evils. Like, that's really the, the mentality that we have here, is that, that, you know, we don't like Iran, you know, or like, North Korea, um, but they are holding in place peace and well-being for a great number of people who are in those regimes, you know? Um, so, um, so like that is a value and, uh, and, and that is worth davening for, which leads me to segue to a different point, which is how do we answer the question of, um, I, I kind of just answered. I meant to set it up, though. The question we had here is, what if the Malchus is evil? Don't we daven for the destruction of evil Malchus? So how do we reckon? T- we do. We, I, I showed you in the Ramam and in the, the um, in the uh, Shmona Esrei of uh, of uh, of the Yom and Narayim, we do daven for the the destruction of evil government. So how do we reconcile that with this? Yeah, Vanessa. I think we daven for like the destruction of the evil, but not for like the people. Like I, 
I'm, I don't know the details. I remember when they, the person who wrote the part in Ishmael Nasser, yeah, they picked him specifically because he was going to write it in a way that like, wasn't just like, let them all die. Like he wrote it in a way yeah. that was like, may like, they come to peace and like beat right. their plowshares or whatever. I don't, I don't remember this. Yeah, I also like, don't remember really because I think it was Shimon Atzadik. I think, I think it was Shimon was the one who did, uh, I don't know. Someone Hakatan. Oh yeah, Hakatan. Yeah, yeah, Shimon, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, cor correct. So, so uh, I was going to give that same answer, but from a different angle, which is, um, hold on though, just give me one second. Maybe that answer doesn't work out. Okay, so okay, the answer you're giving. Let me let me uh, um, uh, <laughs> let me suggest something, and you tell me if this works out with what you're saying. There's two ways to destroy an evil Malchus, right? One is an atomic bomb. Okay, the other is that they do tshuva, and it no longer becomes evil Malchus. And you're saying that that's what it could mean to dive for evil Malchus to be destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. That's a very good resolution. Okay, I, I accept that. Yeah. Anyone else have another answer? Uh, potentially that are better Malchus comes into power. Yeah, right. Okay, good. So, so um, that, um, that you can daven for peace for the, even an evil Malchus, because that's better than anarchy, but simultaneously daven that, that bad Malchus will be replaced by a better one. Yeah, I think those are, those are both good answers. So like davening for the crown of England, but not necessarily for like Elizabeth II. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, okay. So that was Sforno. So according to him, the Chiddush is really about uh, the lesser two evils. Okay. Now for the most shocking one, the Bravanel. Okay. And I'm not even, Bravanel is very long. I'm just going to read his first paragraph. Okay. So actually I got to do a, a refresher. Um, so if you'll remember, Akavia ben Mahalalel, Akavi Mahalala said, contemplate three things and you will not come to transgression. Know from where you came, where you were going, and before whom you will ultimately be given judgment and reckoning. Where did you come from? From a future drop. Where are you going to a place of dirt, maggots, and worms? And before whom will you be, you be given judgment and reckoning? Before the king of kings, the transcendent one who is the source of all good. Okay. So the Bravanel is bothered by what does this Mishnah that we are doing now have to do with that Mishnah? Okay. I don't know that that's a good question. Okay, like these were different people, they lived in different times, but the Ravnel is answering that question. So here's what he says. He says, it would seem according to my method, he says, this is his method, that because Akavia ben Mahalalo said that contemplating three things, um, the contemplating the three things he mentioned will prevent a person from sinning and coming to transgress, Rabbi Hanina, the deputy of Kohen, said that this type of contemplation is not enough. For who of all flesh doesn't know that he came from a future drop and will go to a place of dirt, worms, and maggots? And with all this, he does not refrain from sinning, for the inclination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Rather, distancing oneself from transgression is dependent on the peace of the government. For when there is peace in the land, justice will abound, and judges and officers will eliminate the wickedness in a manner that will cause sinners to cease from the earth and the wicked to be no more. This itself is the essential way to prevent sinning and transgression, not the contemplation mentioned by Rabbi Akavia alone. So he holds that this is a mach locus, okay? That Akavya and Halala says, how do you avoid sin? By contemplating these three things. And Hanina, deputy of the Kohen, uh, Kohanim, says, no, 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 that's not going to do anything. We all know we're going to die. Rather, government is going to save us. Yeah, Vanessa? Is it a mach locus? I think they just work in tandem. Not the contemplation mentioned by Akavya alone. I think he's saying that they work. Well, okay. how I'm reading so, it. Okay, here's the thing. He's... Kavya is saying it is must speak, and he's saying it's not must speak. Enzo must speak, okay. right? So it is. It's not that uh, that Akavya would disagree that davening for the government helps, right? And it's not that uh, Ruchanina would disagree that 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 one works. But he's saying is it sufficient, you know? Um, and okay. and he says at the end also zohemus he ham zohemus he hamenia haatzmis lachataos ulaveros lo hahistaklos lavaj is our Akavya. So he's making it into a mach locus, okay? Okay. Now, the interesting thing about this is, um, you know, the thing we say after Shimon Esrei, the Elokai Netzor, uh, you know, it's, it's called Tachanunim Lachar Tfila. So if you've seen in the Gemara Brachos, there's actually many different versions of that. And we say one of them, but there are different ones. And I've always wanted to go through all of them and give shiros on all of them, but I haven't actually like learned through them yet. One of them, when I read this, I realized that one of them, um, there is one of them that actually talks about both of them. So 
It is in Brachos. Rabbi Alexandre. Um, uh, you know the whole story about the uh, the Jews, why they named? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, someone, uh, what's the story? Like the, the Jews took upon themselves to make Alexander into a Jewish name out of like gratitude? It was, I think some, I don't remember which person it was, someone. Alexander yeah. was about to like destroy the Jews. Then yeah. he had a vision of some prophet. Or, yeah. not, or king or someone. And then he saw and met him when he was like, the brother was coming to like try and say, hey, please don't kill us. Yeah. And he was like, they were like, of course, we'll let you through our town. And then like, to show you that we're not like going to fight you, like we're going to name all of our kids Alexander. <laughs> yeah, I right. wish I remembered the details more. Yeah, I know. That, I also don't remember. That, that's like about as much as I remember. Yeah. Alexandra, did you, do you know any uh, details? <laughs> Um, more or less that, yeah. Okay, yeah. Like, the idea of, like, <laughs> right, so there you go. Leader, so much yeah. gratefulness now. <laughs> All right, so Ruby Alexandri, Buster de Matali Amarhaki, after he died, he would say this Ribon Haolamim, Master of, of Worlds, Galui of Yadua, Lafanacha, Shiritsoninu Lasas Ritonach. It is evident and known before you that our desire is to do your desire, our will is to do your will. Umima Akiv, who prevents us or what prevents us from doing your will? Saor Sheba Isa Veshibud Machios. Okay, the leavening in the dough and the subjugation of governments. Now, what does leavening in the dough mean? Uh, Rashi says, uh, so what prevents us from doing your will? The leavening in the dough, that's a muscle for the evil inclination in our hearts that ferments us. Okay. I never quite got that muscle about like the fermentation, uh, but that is used for the Yitzhahara. So, uh, and he wrote, may it be your will that you save us from their hand, uh, from the hand of both of them. And that we return to do your will, uh, um, the statutes of your will with a full heart. So you see here, he's saying both, right? that Akavya ben Mahalalo is advising you to work on the Yetzirah by contemplating three things that, that, that diminish the Yetzirah in all the ways that we explained uh, in that first year. And then also Shibud Machios is the society you're in affects you and, uh, and, and we are limited in our perfection and in the values we have by the corruptions of the society and the imperfections of the society around us. And that's something that is not within our control and uh, Hashem has to help us with that, you know? So I think it's just, a, it's a cool tefillah that identifies the two things that cause you to, uh, to not do God's will. And it's very, very definitive categories that correspond to those two things that, uh, those two mishnayos, you know? Um, do you think yeah. it's a machlokas about human nature? The machlokas about which one it is? I do think it's a machlokas about human nature, yeah. Um, it, what it kind of reminds me of, this is not exactly a locus, but, um, you know, Aristotle gives two definitions of what the human being is. Uh, one of them, I think people know, what's one of, what was the definition of the human? Human being is a blank blank. Did you say that? What? Yeah, so, 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 so something? I didn't hear. I think it was Vanessa that said something. Yeah. Who said this? Aristotle. Never mind. I think it's like I a know what Diogenes said, but that's oh, okay. I, yeah, the, I the, 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 the same the, thing. I'm thinking the, of the, the chicken uh, without feathers. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's not it. Yeah. So Aristotle said man is a rational animal. Okay. But then in uh, in elsewhere he says man is a political animal. Okay. Um, and politically doesn't mean politics like what we mean. He means like a, a product of the. Um, a member of a society that affects the society is, and is impacted by the society. And I know I've quoted this Rama a million times, uh, but I'm going to quote it again because a million and one is better than a million. Um, uh, the beginning of Hilchos Deus chapter six, I quoted this just this week and also said that I think this is my most often frequently quoted Rama in Hilchos Deus. It's human nature to be drawn after the character traits and actions of his comrade, his fellows, and his friends. And to behave like the people in his society. Therefore, uh, therefore, a person needs to befriend Sadiqim and to sit by Chachamim constantly to learn from their actions. And he should distance himself from the wicked who walk in darkness so that he does not learn from their actions. This is what Shlomo said. Uh, 
uh, one who walks with the wise will become wise, and one who, who uh, befriends fools will be broken. The Omer, and it says in Tehillim, Ashrei ha'ish asher lo halach ba'atzas rishayim, uvaderech ha'tayim lo amad, uvamoshav leitzim lo yashav. Happy slash praiseworthy is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, doesn't stand in the in the uh, way of sinners, and doesn't sit in the session of scorners. So, um, so that is also expressing this truth that you're influenced by your society. But going back to what Ayala was saying, is it a mach locus? So I don't know if it's a mach locus. I don't think Aristotle like was expressing two definitions of human nature. I think he was saying that like, you know, I mean, it's, it's almost like there's, you know, there's psychology and there's sociology, right? Psychology is the study of man, uh, of a human psyche in a vacuum, but man doesn't exist in a vacuum, he exists in a society. And sociology is the study of the impact of, of the group on the person. You, you kind of like have to look at it through both frameworks. You know, it does sound like the Abravanel is learning it though, as to what is the, the real um, thing that prevents, uh, um, you know, people from solving each other alive, you know? And uh, he, he does say that like uh, Ruby Hanina is, is disagreeing with uh, a caveat. So he does seem to say it's a mock locus that might stem from, from human nature. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, okay, let's just go through our questions. I know there's more here. Um, oh, just one thing. Maybe I'll say this for tomorrow's year, actually. Yeah, I'll save it for tomorrow's year because it's, it's going to segue. So let's just see which of our questions we answered, okay? Um, and, uh, and then we'll call it a night. So what is this doing in Pirkei Avos? Uh, what does that have to do with ethics? So Rubina and Yona gave the clearest answer, which is that this is how you cultivate empathy, which, again, to me, I, I, this requires more thought. Like, it's, it's such an abstract way to cultivate empathy, okay? But that's what it is. According to the Meiri, who said that there's Torah leadership and political leadership, and you can't have Torah leadership without political leadership, what is it doing in Pirkei Avos? So anyone want to try to articulate an answer to that question? Um, you could potentially make the argument that in Pirkei Avos, because it's specifically speaking to people who are extra righteous, they're probably going to be the ones that are going to be like the Torah leadership of their time. So yeah. if they're capable of like having that like understanding that the government is important for Torah leadership, then ah, it okay. matters. That's, actually, interconnected. that's very good. That's a better answer than what I was going to give. That that Pirkei Avos is for the extra righteous people, and the Ramam also said that it's for leaders, for Dayanim, you know, or, or rulers. And you know, you do see in different areas of the Jewish world, you do see some Jewish leaders are very involved in keeping their thumb on the pulse of the politics and being involved in political issues and, you know, and, and, and being aware of what's going on. And some Jews just don't care, right? Like they just are, are um, they have their head in the sand or they say, the only issue I'm going to vote about is, is it good for the Jews or is it good for Israel? You know, that's a very, very limited view because it's nice to do things that are good for Israel, but if you're living in America and you're not caring about what goes on in America, that could be bad for you. And you can't have Torah leadership when, you know, it's, uh, when, 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 uh, you know, when there's no peace in the government, you know? So, so uh, I think that's a good answer for what that's doing in Pirkei Avos. Yeah, Vanessa? This might be off topic. What, or maybe more just a tangent point. If you're living in America, I understand praying for everyone. Is there a reason why you should focus on America specifically? I guess because you should have more empathy because you live there, or um, I was just saying, I was just using America because I because because we live there, and that you know, praying for something that does affect you is easier to pray for than something that doesn't affect you. But Rabina Yona is definitely saying pray for everyone, um, and Meiri is saying that you're really in Meiri's idea, you're really only praying for governments that do affect Torah leadership, right? Like, you're not going to pray for, um, you know, like, uh, I mean, yeah, right, right, exactly. <laughs> That's, I was trying to think of an example that wouldn't be offensive. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's pretty, I don't think they're just New Guinea. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, two, what is meant by each man would swallow his fellow alive? Um, oh, sorry, sorry. And then according to the Bravanel for question one, what is he doing in Avos? It's doing, it's in Avos because he holds that, this is the main thing that prevents people from sinning and Akavia's thing is not going to cut it. You know, like you need, uh, you need the government in, in, in function to be ethical, you know, in order for you to be ethical. All right. What is man meant by each man who swallows fellow alive? So um, we didn't really go into why it expresses itself that way. It's based on a pasuk in Habakkuk that says that uh, don't make, uh, maybe I quoted it somewhere. Um, 
or I just saw it quoted. No, I didn't quote it. Uh, it says something like, um, uh, don't make men like the fish of the sea. Uh, and the, the Gemara quotes this and says that we're it, basically it's a uh, might makes right, you know, that uh, the bigger one swallows the smaller one. Um, so it, it, so it, it's saying, according to that idea, it's saying a specific thing uh, that um, anarchy is going to, anarchy is not chaos. Anarchy is going to devolve into tyranny of some form because it's going to be might makes right until you get a hierarchy again, you know? Um, and so th that's why it uses this phrase because uh, it, it's comparing it to fish that the bigger one eats the smaller one. Um, and also this is Rabbi Chait's idea that this is showing you that like, it's just every person is intrinsically evil in the sense that they're just animalistically selfish, you know? Three, what does Malchus mean here? So according to uh, Mi'iri and Rabbeinu Yona, it really means any form of government that has enforcement capabilities. And according to the Sforno, it's talking specifically about a king. Okay, but I think Sforno would agree that like having a government will prevent people from doing this also. Four, worth of Malchus is evil. Best of, uh, better, uh, it's the lesser of two evils, right? That's what we said. Um, and there are ways to daven for the Shalom of the Malchus. What's best shalom the best shalom is when you are living in line with torah you know or living in line with like the the truth and you protect yourself and do tshuva and all that good stuff what's the cause and effect uh relationship between fear of the malchus and each man swallowing his fellow alive we didn't really talk about that so much but but we were kind of dancing around the point that it's deterrent right is that that there that there has to be some fear of consequence people do not behave ethically unless they fear punishment and again this is we see this all over the place that there is a level you can get to where you care about righteousness per se, but most of us start, all of us start off on Lola Shema, which is fear of punishment. Um, we didn't really address this question about why does it say peace if it really means fear? Um, maybe the answer though that like, um, that Vanessa and uh, Alexandra gave uh, fits in with this is that, that if you just say, you know, Hashem may people fear the government, that is not really aspiring for anything higher. But if you say, for peace of government, that, you know how, I, okay, uh, I mean, I know Ayala knows this, but like in my tefillah class, I always say like, uh, formulate your bakashos in a way which is like honest, but like allows you to level up in perfection, you know? So like, if you daven for the peace of the government, that could mean on a lower, the lowest level, just not anarchy, but it could also help you to level up to think, well, what would be good is, uh, what would be the way the government would really get peace if they really understood human nature and had chesed tzedakah and mishpat and like it could level up, you know? But what we really care about is the result of people fearing because that's gonna prevent us from destroying each other. Uh, is it really true? Uh, we didn't go into a proof from outside of the Mishnah, but you got the Pusuk in the Torah from this week's Parsha, that's good enough for me. And based on Mishle, I'm convinced that everyone is selfish. So, you know, uh, that's, that's, that's my view. And then seven, what does a Shalom Shalmachus mean? What are we davening for? So we just said that also is that bare minimum is functioning to be able to enforce things, but on a higher level is true peace, which is like living in line with truth and, and, uh, and goodness. Okay, so the question though, is what are we gonna do with this, right? So I, I, I'm gonna end off with proposing an experiment, okay? This is something, oh, I, okay, I, I should say this in general. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard me say this either live or like on, on various uh, shirim, but I happen to think that the best way to change yourself is instead of taking upon yourself permanent changes, you do limited time experiments. And a good method for doing that is using Rosh Chodesh, okay? Either doing 30-day experiments or even doing two week experiments. Okay, so Rosh Chodesh was, uh, was, uh, was Tuesday and Wednesday. So I have a bunch of experiments that I'm doing. Uh, one of the experiments I tried earlier in the year, which I wanna try doing again, is when I'm davening Shemona Esrei and I get to Sim Shalom, okay? Pausing for one breath, breathe in and out, to think of one specific person, group, entity that, that would be beneficial if they were given peace, okay? So it's just, I don't know about you, but even my best Shmona Esrays, I'm out of Kavana by the time I get to Zim Shalom, you know? So like, like I can usually hold it together through Shema Kalenu or maybe Modim, but by Sim Shalom, I'm just like, like getting to the end. So like stopping and then having one breath. And I even have a bookmark in my, uh, my sitter. Um, I, I need to get like a sticky note, something like colorful, um, but um, pausing and then 
and then thinking to myself, when I say Sim Shalom, I'm talking, uh, I'm including this specific person, entity, or like whatever. So like, look, Pirkei Abbas is for people who want to be a chassid. You don't have to down for the government. It's not a chiyuv, right? But like you can, this would be a good slot to like stick that in. But, you know, I think it'd be beneficial if you did that for other people also, like people who, who in your life, either your friends or your enemies who like could really use some shalom, you know, uh, and it'll, it'll do that. So that, that's the, the, uh, the experiment I, I suggest that, that we try for the Sponas, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, next week, Blinetter, we will do the next Mishnah or the next part of this Mishnah, if you count it that way. Okay. Thanks for coming. Have a good Thank night. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a good night. Thank you.